Get on to the New Testament today. I finished with this quote yesterday from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12. When I am lifted up, I shall draw all men to myself. Now, our Lord was referring, of course, to his upcoming crucifixion on Mount Calvary. Yet when he was crucified, when we read the various gospel accounts of our Lord's crucifixion, who were there? Not all men were there at that time. We have, of course, Our Lady. We have four Marys there, in fact. Our Lady, Mother of Jesus. We have her sister, St. John, in his Gospel, chapter 19, refers to the next Mary as the sister of Our Lady, Mary of Clopas, who's actually the mother of the brothers and sisters sisters of Jesus. We hear about the brothers and sisters of Jesus. They are actually the children of Our Lady's sister, who's probably her cousin. The word there is used in a generic sense. Mary, the wife of Clopas. We have, of course, St. Mary Magdalene, the third Mary at the foot of the cross. We have Salome, otherwise known as Mary Salome. Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of the apostles, St. John and St. James the Greater. Uh, by the way, Mary of Clopas, who I've mentioned already, she was the mother of two apostles herself, James the Less and Jude Thaddeus. So there was a whole family situation there at the foot of the cross. These were the faithful ones. When we remember when we speak about the tree of life and the fruit that comes from the tree of life, whether the original tree in the Garden of Eden or the tree erected by Moses in Sinai and now the greatest of all trees of life, that of our Lord on Mount Calvary, it's those who are in friendship with God who could come before that tree. And of course we have the Apostle St. John. A lot happens at the foot of the cross as we know. St. John's actual mother is there, that's Salome. His natural mother is there. And we have our Lord adding to that natural motherhood, the spiritual motherhood of Our Lady upon St. John as well, as we know. Sadly, I can't go into that in much detail here today. But I'll focus on St. John. Here's St. John, the youngest of the apostles, about 18 years of age, impetuous, one of the sons of thunder, he didn't have the cowardice and the human respect that sadly the, that we're all plagued with and the apostles suffered from. They fled. They were not there at the foot of the cross. Here's St. John, the remnant apostle, bishop, so to speak, representing the remnant faithful church that's there at the foot of the cross. And he notes something and records it in his gospel. What appears to be a minor event, but very significant, not mentioned by the other gospel writers, St. Matthew the Apostle and the two evangelists, not mentioned by them. We know that our Lord was crucified with two others, and they had to be, so to speak, finished off before nightfall. If you've ever been to Israel, I've been to Israel. I was traveling there on my honeymoon with my wife, and I was in a taxi up we just come back from Mount Carmel up in the north and we're driving back to Tel Aviv and it was four o'clock in the afternoon and the, the, the Jewish gentleman just pulled the car over on the side and said, sorry, the Sabbath is about to begin. Could you, if you mind, please, I have to let you off. I have to stop working. So we got into an Arab taxi after that. But <laughs> then it started raining and he was flying down about 100 kilometers an hour in the rain. I thought it was terrible. No seatbelts or anything. But... The Sabbath is about to begin, the great Sabbath here. So the crucifixion of these three men, including our Lord, had to be concluded. So they went up and they broke the legs of the other two. They went up to our Lord and they saw that he was apparently already dead. He was already dead. But these are professional executioners. They can't assume that someone's dead. They have to make sure that the job is done. If our Lord was walking around Jerusalem the next morning, the executioners would have been out of a job, to say the least. So an expert Roman marksman went up to our Lord. If you know what a Roman spear looked like, thick, long handle, 
but a thin part, the last one third was thin, and the, the head itself, the arrowhead, was very thin. And this marksman knew exactly where to blow our Lord, where to hit him, in the right side between which ribs, and he got him. He pierced him through the right side between the ribs, across into our Lord's heart, and when he withdrew the spear, two things came forth from our Lord's side. And St. John speaks very solemn, solemnly of what he saw when he records this in his gospel. From the side of our Lord came blood and water. And this is extremely important here. This is the tree of life, the new tree of life, and our Lord is about to give us new wonderful spiritual food. And now the food is flowing from this tree. The blood and the water represent the two great sacraments, baptism and the Eucharist. Our Lord gave us seven sacraments, seven, the number of perfection and completion, sacrament for each moment of our, each important stage in our lives. But out of the seven sacraments, he speaks of two that are imperative, that we must have. And they are these two sacraments, baptism and the Eucharist. Go back to St. John chapter 3, the conversation with Nicodemus. Unless you're born again of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life in you. These are not optional sacraments. That's why the church says we must be baptized. That's why the church says we must receive the Eucharist at least once a year. They're gifts. We cannot despise such wonderful gifts. Now there's something here even more deep and more beautiful. Here we have our Lord. Our Lord is the second Adam. The first Adam, of course, we know, was Adam in paradise. And Adam was the head of humanity. But Adam had a spouse as well. He couldn't find companionship in any of the other animals. Remember yesterday, he named all the animals and he gave them a name that was related to their essence. He understood the essence of each animal and he gave them a name that reflected that essence, that nature. He couldn't have companionship with them. But our Lord God himself gave Adam the suitable, appropriate companion. And he drew the spouse of Adam from Adam's side. From a rib from his side. And that spouse Eve was therefore nourished by the flesh and blood of the first Adam. And Christ is the second Adam, greater than the original Adam, the God-man. Our Lord. He too was to have a spouse. That spouse is the church. His bride, adorned with the merits, the merits of the saints. That spouse is also to be formed and nourished by the flesh and blood of the groom. This one, Christ himself. So from the side, the church of Christ, the church, the spouse of Christ, is born. Born through baptism, nourished by the Eucharist. Now let's look at baptism in some detail. Yesterday we spoke about the, the mysterious rock that followed the people of God in Sinai, the Evan Shemiah. How that rock was pierced in the side by Moses with his rod. And out forth came water that brought natural life, sustained the natural life of the people of God in Sinai. We, Ezekiel, the prophet, a prophet of the chosen people during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC, he too had a revelation given to him. The temple had just been destroyed, the great temple of Solomon. It was a national disaster, spiritual disaster for the Jewish nation in 586 BC. The temple in which God dwelt was destroyed. The glory of God was present in the Holy of Holies in that temple. The Shekinah glory or the Shekinah Kabod, 
in Hebrew. God was present. Cloud by day, fire by night in the Holy of Holies. The image that was given to Ezekiel is that he saw the second temple, a restored temple in prophecy, in a, in a vision. But under the threshold, coming forth, under the threshold of the foundation of that temple that he saw, flowed a gushing stream of water from the right side of that temple underneath the foundation. And wherever that water flowed, it brought life to the world. What Ezekiel really saw was not a literal vision of the restored second temple. He saw a type of Christ himself. Christ said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The second temple when it was finally restored, the temple of Zerubbabel, and which was being restored during the time of Herod the Great and when Christ was walking on earth. The second temple didn't have the Shekinah Kabod, didn't have the glory of God dwelling within it as the first temple did. That was because Christ himself was to be the Shekinah glory of the second temple. He was the temple and he was the glory of that temple. When we read in the, the opening chapters of St. John's Gospel, when our Lord came, first time to Jerusalem, he came to the temple and he cast out the money changers. Apparently he did it twice. If we, we reconcile the Gospel accounts here. He cast, them, he cast them out and said, My father's house will be known as a house of prayer. You've made into a den of thieves. Then he, the Son of God, claimed his inheritance, his father's house, purified it out. Our Lord was the temple and its glory. So we have here beautiful types about baptism. The Evan Shemia rock and the water that flowed from its side. The vision that Ezekiel had of the temple and the water that flowed from its side. And our Lord himself on the cross, the tree of life and the water that flowed from his side. Baptism itself was prophesied a number of times in the Old Testament. Ezekiel again in chapter 36, Zechariah in chapter 13. When we put the two prophets together and what they wrote, they speak of a time when God will sprinkle his people with water and change their hearts of stone to hearts of flesh and wash them of their sins and their impurities, their idolatries, and give them the Spirit of God. That's exactly what baptism does. Baptism does many things. Let's look firstly, before I explain what baptism does for us, as a great fruit from this tree of life. This is not optional, as I said before, when we looked at John chapter 3, verse 5. Our Lord commands it at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, we have recorded there in chapter 28, go forth and teach all nations baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The end of St. Mark's Gospel in chapter 16, our Lord says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. St. Peter in his first epistle in chapter 3 verse 21 speaks of baptism. He refers to Noah in the flood, the flood waters, Water sent by God that covered the world and washed the world of sin. St. Peter says that was a type of baptism that saves us now. Those in the ark, those in the church were saved. The waters of the flood brought those into the ark. The waters of baptism brings us into the ark of the church, the spouse of Christ, the body of Christ. And we are in the church. We shall be saved if we persevere. This is, we look at other effects of baptism. Christ, he was the anointed one. That's what Christ means. We as Christians are also to be anointed. We are incorporated into Christ. We become part of him. We marry into him because of baptism. The mystical body of Christ. That's what we become part of. And through baptism, we are anointed. We are Christed, so to speak. We receive an indelible mark on our souls that remains forever. The fathers of the church called this the seal. 
St. Justin Martyr, in chapter 61 of his apology to the Emperor Antoninus Pius when trying to explain the rites that the Christians engaged in, spoke about this. The waters of regeneration, that's what St. Paul said when he wrote to Titus. The waters that restore us to the life of grace. The participation in God's own divine nature. Lost because of original sin, now being restored to us by the new Adam Christ. That mark, that character, that seal identifies us objectively as Christians. It can never be removed from our souls. It remains a mark on our souls forever. Not even mortal sin can, re can remove it. Of course, other wonderful things that we receive through baptism. Gifts given to us by God to enable us to be like Christ in the world. Of course, we get sanctifying grace, the participation in God's own divine nature, created participation. With that, we get infused theological virtues of faith, hope and charity to enable us to have that perfect relationship with God. The other virtues, the moral virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence and justice to enable us to live with our neighbour well, as well as with God, to give our neighbour what is due, to love our neighbour according to Christ's teachings. Seven gifts of the Holy Spirit rights to actual graces. It's an abundance. It's an overflow of gifts and help given by God so we can be imitators of Christ in the world. So much we can say about baptism. It's just such a wonderful gift. There's, there's, there's a greater percentage of the population in Australia that's that is becoming that are the unbaptized. What a tragedy. This will only increase the influence of Lucifer over us in the world because it's through baptism that we are freed from this slavery. The dominion that Lucifer gained over humanity because of original sin. When we fell from the supernatural order to the natural order, we fell under the influence, the dominion of Lucifer a greater creature than us in nature. But we are freed from that slavery through baptism. It's a sacrament we cannot afford to ever neglect. Let's now look at the Eucharist, the other, the magnificent fruit of the tree of life of our Lord on Mount Calvary. A year before Mount Calvary occurred for us, our Lord spoke wonderful words. We all know about the feeding of the 5,000, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Yes, it wasn't just a miracle of caring and sharing. It was a real miracle of multiplication of the loaves. We read about that in chapter 5. The people were amazed. Thousands of them, at least 5,000 men. There was more than 5,000 people there. Five loaves, two fishes. The number seven appears again. This is a symbol of the Eucharist. Sorry, more than the Eucharist, all the seven sacraments, how God, through Christ, through the apostles, through the church, will feed us with a food continually that will never run out. The supernatural divine food of grace that comes to us through the sacraments. But these people at the time appreciated our Lord's miracle, but were still very carnal. Not spiritual enough to appreciate exactly where our Lord was taking them. They followed him. The next morning when they woke up, they saw our Lord was gone. He'd walked on the water, a second great miracle he did for the benefit of his disciples. And they followed him around the lake and they finally caught up with him. They were hoping for another free sandwich. Right, they've been fed the day before. This is great. Let's go after this man. We can have more food for free. Our Lord upbraided them for that mentality. And I'm going to read to you extensive sections from the chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. He confronts them and says the following, Our Lord, Do not labour for the food which perishes. You want a free sandwich? That food will perish. But for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. This is more than two years into our Lord's public mission. This is the third Passover he's spending with his disciples. He's already given them wonderful spiritual foods. He's preaching, he's teaching, his example, his miracles. This is another food he's not yet given them that he promises that he will give them sometime in the future. 
For on him has the Father set his seal. Now, if you're going to get this spiritual food which I offer you sometime in the future, what must we do to receive it? This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. To be eligible to receive this wonderful food, we must firstly have faith in Christ. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? That was slow. The day before that had all been fed miraculously through the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. And they're saying, if we're going to believe in you, well, what sign can you do so that we can trust in you? Then they say the following, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then our Lord corrects them and says, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. It was not Moses. Moses was the instrument. My father gave you that true bread. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's interesting because the manna in the desert only gave life to the Jewish people. The Israelites who were following Moses as the deliverer out of Egypt. It wasn't a bread that was given to anyone else. But our Lord's bread that he is going to give, that he is offering now, promising to give sometime in the future, is a bread that's going to give life to the whole world. And it's not just a natural life as the manna gave in the desert. This is going to be more than natural life. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now I'm going to emphasize one other aspect of the Eucharist here. <clears throat> Our Lord is promising this new bread to give life to the whole world, and he equates it with eternal life. Resurrection, the glorified body. And I will raise him up at the last day. Six times he says this in this chapter. Jesus answered them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. Remember in the garden, the original tree of life, you eat the fruit of that tree, you will not die. You come up before the tree in Sinai that Moses erected, you'd been bitten by the snake, you will not die of the snake bite. Our Lord is now offering us another fruit from another tree, we eat of that fruit, we will not die. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. What a food. He is giving us himself, the divine son of God, body, blood, soul and divinity. What was the nature of the fruit of the tree of life in the garden? We don't know exactly. Whatever it was, it was not the nature of this fruit. Christ himself God himself, the divine son of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. This is when death will be conquered. Right now, if we're in a state of grace, we've been restored to supernatural life with God. We are sons and daughters of God right now. We are justified right now if we are in a state of grace. But we still labor under the other consequences of original sin. Pain, sickness, suffering, ignorance, malice, debility, concupiscence, lust, pride. We're all going to die. When are these consequences of original sin going to be conquered? They're going to be conquered on the last day at the general resurrection. And what is the food of the general resurrection? It is the Eucharist that our Lord is promising here one year before his death on Mount Calvary. But there are some of you that do not believe. They began to murmur. 
There was a whole lot of disciples there. They heard this. What's going on? We were following this man. We thought he was a prophet. He's telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is cannibalism. We cannot handle this. This is the accusations that Christians will carry with them against them for centuries. When you read the writings of the early church fathers, the common accusation is that the Christians were man-eaters, cannibals, thiestian feasts. There's a long Greek word I find difficult to pronounce, anthropopagy. They were accused of anthropopagy, that is, eating men. Many have misunderstood this teaching for centuries, but the teaching has always been the same. Later on, we'll look at the fathers as examples of what they have to say. Now, these words troubled many. Even one of the disciples himself. Not this version I'm carrying here, the Revised Standard Version, but another common version in the English-speaking world, the Knox Version, says the following... speaks of them, for Jesus knew which of them did not believe and which one of them was to betray him. Which one of those who did not believe was to betray him. That's the Knox version of the Bible in English. Which one of them was to betray him was Judas. Commonly we think that Judas betrayed our Lord because he was greedy. He was a thief. He stole from the common purse. He liked to get, you know, make money out of Jesus and got 30 pieces of silver for it. But remotely, the, the beginning of his troubles was here a year before. He could not cope with what our Lord had said about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's when he perhaps began to have the doubts that ultimately led to his apostasy and his betrayal of our Lord. But what about us? We're like St. Peter. St. Peter the fisherman. He wasn't a great theologian at this stage. Our Lord challenged him, and what about you? Will you also leave? And what did St. Peter say? He gave a great Catholic answer. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Meaning, I don't understand exactly what you're saying, but I accept it on faith because I know who you are because of what you've said and what you've done. I accept it on faith. We don't have to have an exact scientific understanding of the Eucharist. The theologians and philosophers in the church throughout her history have done a wonderful job to expound it for us. And we have many insights into it. But it's still one of the greatest mysteries in the church. The Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the Eucharist. We are to be like St. Peter. We will come because you have the words of eternal life. And we accept it on that basis. Now, when was this food first given to us? Well, actually, ironically, it's not St. John's Gospel that gives us the account of when the food was first given to us. It's the other three Gospels. The other three Gospels record the Last Supper. A year later, when our Lord says the following, and we know these words very well, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is one event, the Last Supper in Mount Calvary. One whole event, the Passion. It begins at the Last Supper and climaxes with the words, It is finished on the cross. Now, the great thing about Mount Calvary is our Lord, remember what he said. When I am lifted up, I shall draw all men to myself. He has fulfilled that promise. We weren't there 2,000 years ago in 30 AD. I think it was the 14th of April in 30 AD. We weren't there. If I had a time machine and I was, had one coin to use, and where would you go in this time machine? You've got one $2 coin. Where would you want to go? I would want to go there to Mount Calvary, outside Jerusalem, 30 AD. But I can't. But Christ makes it possible. And he makes it possible for us through the Mass. Do this in memory of me. That's when he made his disciples priests. He commanded them to do what he had just done. Because that's what the whole purpose of the church is for. To continue the work of Christ in the world. 
Not just the ministry of the word, preaching and teaching, but governing and sanctifying, curing, miracles, raising the dead. That is what the church still does. Forgives sins. Gives us the, his people, his spouse, the food, his flesh and his blood. That's what the church still does today. And the mass is not just representing Calvary, it represents it. What a great sacrament. Mystically, Calvary is enabled, is moved by Christ so we can be present. Moved in time and place. It's the same event, but in a different form. Unbloody um, manner. And we can be present at Calvary. We're actually present at the same event when we are at Mass. Think about it. Remember how it used to be, those good old days, so to speak, you used to come into a church and you used to see the altar on three steps? That wasn't just an architectural design. Those three steps represented Mount Calvary. The priest is another Christ in the person of Christ. The one offering the sacrifice and the one being offered. This is my body, this is my blood. That's what the priest says. Another Christ. We can be present at Mount Calvary when we attend Mass. There was only one tree of life in the garden. There was only one pole at, in Sinai. There was only one cross of our Lord on Mount Calvary, but he's enabled this new tree of life to have many branches and to extend throughout the centuries until the end of the world. We can come to this tree of life and eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood. We can eat the fruit of this tree of life, the food that will give us resurrection and eternal life. And here we have the connection with baptism. Remember, baptism in the Eucharist flowed from the same wound from our Lord's right side. They came out together at the same time. Because we could not go to the tree of life in the garden and eat its fruit, or approach that tree in Sinai, or come up before our Lord on Mount Calvary if we were not one of the faithful ones, repentant in God's friendship. We need to be repentant and in God's friendship to come up before the new tree of life, hear the mass, and to eat of the fruit of that tree. We need to be baptized first, to be made a son and daughter of God again, to be back in friendship with God. Remember Adam and Eve were driven out of paradise, out of the eastern gate, and the entrance was blocked by the cherubim. Go to Europe, you go to some churches today in the West still, even in my right, in the Maronite right. Where did baptisms used to take place? You go to Florence, you go to Pisa, you see the great cathedrals there. They have a baptistry separate, a huge building by itself, magnificent, outside of the church. When a baptism takes place in the Maronite right, it's at the door of the church because you're not allowed to enter into through the eastern gate unless you're once again a child of God, a friend of God. And when we're baptized, we're now that child of God again. And we can come through again the eastern gate and re-enter paradise as a justified son and daughter of God. The parish church is the restored paradise. It's made paradise by Christ's presence. Our Lord present there in the tabernacle, that wonderful red lamp shining there in the corner, tells us that God is present in this house. As God was present originally, fire by night, cloud by day, the Shekinah glory in the Holy of Holies in the temple. God in this form is present once again in his own houses. And that presence makes those houses paradise. New Edens we can come into. Baptised, we re-enter that new Eden and we can come up before the new tree of life and we can eat that fruit the flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the new fruit of immortality, resurrection, and the glorified body. We must come with proper dispositions, as I've said. We've heard this quote already mentioned. 
I'll read from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are sick and some of you have died. So if we're not careful, we don't come up with proper dispositions. This fruit of life can become for us a fruit of death if we're not careful. I could read from the Father's many quotes. Point, I'll point you, however, in the limited time I have, I see the light flashing three minutes to go. But look at the new encyclical by Pope John Paul II on the Eucharist because he refers to the Father's many, many times. It was St. Justin Martyr and what he said in chapter 66 of his first apology that convinced me about the truth of Catholic doctrine. I was with Baptists for six years and I was unsure about the Catholic faith, but when I read what he had to say about the Eucharist, I came back. And finally, the tree of life is not over for us. We read it again in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, as I come to finish now. In the first book, in Genesis, in the last book, in the tree of life, is now a reward for us. Reading it here. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, analogy to baptism, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations as the Eucharist is. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to, to eat to the, of the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates." St. Paul said, as I began my talk yesterday, if there be no resurrection, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But as Christians, we can say something else, because there is a resurrection. And we can come and eat and drink of his body and blood and be joyful, because for the Eucharist, tomorrow we will live eternally. Thank you very much.